Good morning. Very much welcome to this morning session, the Expert Talk 2024, focusing on the topic urban development for care. This is a continuous webinar and breakfast seminar series that we are throwing this May and June uh, as a follow-up to the trend spotting seminar that we at Tristan Summer held in February this year. So as I said, welcome. Uh, we are from Dresden Summer in Sweden, uh, a company based uh, actually in Stockholm, but uh, in several countries all over the world. Our purpose is uniting opposites to create a world we want to live in. And that's uh, one of the things we're going to touch base on this morning in this uh, breakfast and webinar casting that we are throwing today. We are founded in 1970, we are partner managed and we are more than 5,000 people working at Dresden Summer. Actually, I would say some plus 6,000, but these are modest figures uh, based uh, in uh, all over Europe and in some countries over the Atlantic on the other side and in Asia APEC, 60 locations worldwide. We have our clients and the stakeholders we work together in within three different clusters, real estate, infrastructure and industry. And we work with everything from consulting uh, to implementation. And me greeting you today, I am Karin Stål, having the honor of being the Swedish MD for Dresden Summer. Following up the transporting seminar, maybe I know that some of you were there already in February at the Stockholm Handelskammare, Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, and then you met not only me, but five of uh, the peers from our company, actually including a researcher, Karina from Meladalen University. But you will not meet all of them today. You will meet up with uh, Tobias and the rest uh, of the gang you will see throughout the seminars planned for this uh, spring. So today we're going to deep dive a bit more into the urban development for care. We talk about the increasing importance of community, well-being and inclusivity. We talk about urban planning and designing and prioritizing initiatives. And for that, we have invited our colleague, uh, Tobias Golst, uh, based in Berlin. Hi and good morning, Tobias. Good morning to Stockholm and uh, to the rest of Europe from Berlin. Good morning. Morning. Divisional Director, Integrated Urban Solution. That's actually a perfect fit for being uh, one of the keynotes and uh, keeping the presentation together this morning. Uh, when we met in February on stage, we touched based on among other things, what we're going to talk about today, focusing also a bit more on the S maybe in the ESG, but we will come back to that. Uh, what do you think, Tobias? Should we start with a uh, quick recap on what we talked about in February? Are you up to that? Yeah, sure. I think uh, due to the technical issues this morning, I'm going to uh, maybe speed up a bit and uh, I guess we want to keep the time. So just uh, for you guys, I think I will jump over the part um, a bit quicker than expected. Uh, but yeah, again, um, very good morning to all of you. Um, as Karen just said, nowadays we sp uh, speak a lot about ESG and we talk a lot about um, sustainable buildings. Um, I like today uh, uh, to zoom out a bit more and talk about what makes a city sustainable. Um, for me, a sustainable city is a foremost a healthy city the trends that Karen just mentioned around parks, roads, infrastructure are focused on the space between buildings and define what kind of daily experience we have while we move uh, from our home, place of work, schools, kindergarten and so on. Um, but in the discussion of sustainability and tackling climate change, this urban fabric and how it actually impacts our daily life is um, often overlooked. So we discuss the right amount of CO2 emissions, uh, we, uh, which is, if you ask me, quite abstract and nothing a person can really feel or relate to. However, our personal well-being is somehow more relatable. Uh, for me, health is more than uh, just a feeling um, or a big trend on lifestyle products. Instead, it should be more viewed as capital, a common good that creates economic and social value for the whole society. So regarding ESG, the S should be more approached as an enabler for well-being 
and economic growth. So um, when you look at these um, maybe yeah not so nice pictures, I want to come back to the city and give you a few examples on how the urban space influence our health. You probably heard that people in cities have a shorter life expectancy. But did you know that commuters who spend more than 45 minutes a day traveling each way have a lower life satisfaction, are more likely to suffer and to, yeah, from physical and mental illness and have a higher risk of a heart attack? And noise is actually more harmful to our health than many other environmental factors. In Germany, noises uh, cause more than 10,000 premature deaths per year. Fine dusk, which we talk quite a lot, especially in Berlin, is only around 4,000 deaths only. Uh, finally, uh, studies have shown uh, that loneliness is even more deadly than obesity. A lack of social integration is an increase of a premature death by 50%. With obesity, the risk is 5% lower. Right? Still high, but lower. Of course, um, there's another side to the story, right? The city is not only bad. So um, just maybe as a little warm up session this morning, I want you to imagine a place you like to uh, stop by on your way home, um, somewhere where you yeah, go on the weekend to lighten the mood, something you just enjoy, um, a place. So myself, uh, I go to, to the woods on Sunday, it's a little ritual, I take my bike, drive it for 10, 15 minutes and take a walk around the lake. This helps me to calm down, clear my head and sparks my creativity. It's like a little vacation moment I enjoy. So if you would maybe combine all of these pictures that you just created in your head, you probably would have the most livable city in Europe because a livable city is focused on the small scale of people's everyday life. So why don't we just use health as a motivational driver for sustainable change? Wouldn't it be great to be more healthy just by living in the city. To achieve this, we need to transform our cities from a car center to a people centered space. We need to care about people. We need to prioritize walkability, calmness, community. And we need to understand our cities in a new way, how we can create connectivity between districts. For me, this begins and ends with a deeper understanding of city users and goes beyond demographics. It's important to recognize that our values, our lifestyle, our social group uh, we participate in shape our behavior much more than our age uh, or our generation. Uh, by understanding what motivates people, we can then thereby design our urban spaces to encourage a sustainable and healthy living. Of course, we can't only care about people uh, when we would it only look at it from a user center perspective uh, actually wouldn't be that sustainable. So we also need to care about the planet we inhabit. Um, so we like to follow the principles of life centered design, which recognizes the interconnectedness of biodiversity of animals and people. It's a holistic approach that seeks harmony between our actions and the natural world, recognizing that the health of one is inseparable from the health of all. So at the end, when I look at the future of cities, it's about enabling life. Bring life to the city, bring the city to life. For us at recent summer, a future-proof place must be livable, sustainable and affordable. Uh, we believe that these like key criteria that we need to prioritize when we approach the city uh, of the future. And for us, uh, the only way to achieve that um, is by integrated solutions. So what, what do I mean with integrated solutions? I will explain that in our deep dives and show you like a, a practical example. But very shortly, what do we do at Race and Sommer on that urban scale? Um, so we advertise, so we consult, we conceptualize, we plan, we manage projects on an urban scale uh, with the aim um, to implement integrated solutions uh, to inclusive and enriching living spaces. So this regards all kinds of projects from a mixed use city, um, from new district uh, Berlin, for example, very close to our Hauptbahnhof, um, to the university campus or transforming residential neighborhoods from the 60s into a new multifunctional space. So we have our approach of integrated solutions that we address on all these kinds of projects. Uh, and what we learned from all these projects is that we actually need to work earlier in a more holistic way 
Um, so for example, just instead of uh, going from um, yeah, one aspect to another to create an urban design first, and then a few months later, someone like an engineer comes in and looks at the CO2 emission and the possible energy solutions, we kind of like to work um, holistically in the beginning um, and do these holistic concepts. And you see a bit of our mythology here. Um, and uh, we have this, this model co uh, called from prototype to production. So we like to define the right project requirements quite early uh, in the projects, um, connecting all the expertise. Um, and we do that by connecting traditional engineering expertise and developing services and principles of design thinking. So taking uh, a bit also from the idea of from product design, customer centricity. Uh, we have a colleague from Giel Institute who also will join our discussion later. I'm, I'm, I'm quite keen on his perspective regarding user-centered aspect. So our goal is in the end to implement these kind of projects from the vision uh, to the operation um, and um, yeah, to maybe put one one more key message into your head, uh, what, what we like uh, or what we find is like central on, on our work is that there are two aspects um, that we need to work user-centered, user-oriented, and um, we always try to make place-based solution. So it's user-oriented, place-based and integrated solutions. Um, and we start with the user. So we ask these kind of questions, which users are on site, who is already there, who do we want to attract, what is missing on this location? What do we need to add so it will be attractive to the future users? What do they do? Um, what kind of potential distraction does the location offer? So we go back and forth and create this, I would say, the vision uh, strategy. And after that, we can go in to all these uh, aspects from mobility, um, creating uh, the smart infrastructure, urban planning, climate, water. Um, and we have all these uh, expertise in our house. So. Uh, we can actually work as if 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 we want to or if we ask to uh, to work as a one-stop shop for these kind of holistic urban development projects but enough uh, about us this just as like a little um briefing on what Dresden Sommer does uh, on an urban scale um we want to jump in and into our deep dives uh, the first deep dive uh, will be by you, Alejandra Lundberg Santa Cruz, uh, having the honor of having you as a colleague, a close colleague, uh, head of real estate. You are also an architect and, among other things, uh, accessibility specialist expert. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we now ha have on the screen here, so I just leave the word to you, Alejandra. Hi, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so happy to be here, part of Dree Summers, and share a little bit of something that is close to my heart. Uh, I'm a Swedish architect, but I'm born in South America. And after uh, studying architecture, some years after, I decided that it was time to go back and do a project. And I actually did a postmaster uh, with, uh, together with UNICEF about the making of every day in a city of constant exception. This is Rio de Janeiro in 2014. And actually everything started with uh, UNICEF getting information from the LA police saying that they experienced something called time paralysis. And time paralysis was when they were gonna shoot somebody or stop somebody and they felt that the time stopped. They were frozen and they couldn't act. And as UNICEF started to see what this time paralysis had in common was that these policemen and this person, they had shared playground as children. So they started to see this, that actually sharing the playground is something that bounds us biologically. And uh, as we get biologically bound is the same thing as women that can actually, that uh, align their menstrual cycle is exactly the same thing that happened to these people that by sweating together and sharing the space, they intended to protect each other. And it's something that we have embedded in our DNA from many years, thousands of years ago. So this is Rio de Janeiro. I'm just going to take it a little bit faster. Um, and just to understand the city, how the city has developed. Uh, Brazil, as you know, is a colony, a Portuguese colony. And all these colonies around the world share one thing, and is the unfair appropriation of land. So as you have a slavery and unfair appropriation of land, you tend to see the shape of the city uh, is 
different from cities that haven't been colonized. So if you take the next slide, uh, Tobias. Um, yes, uh, we saw crash and the favelas because, you know, the favelas is actually something that has been built by people that um, didn't have the were slaves and didn't get in her land and they take land uh, and grow these areas um, unofficially. So uh, I'm here doing a study of connectivity and place based solution in a favela called Mare. It's an official favela, which means we don't have real data of how many people live in these areas. We don't have all the data of how many people die or uh, how they are registered or addresses, but we have more or less some um, data. So all the studies started by studying density. And Mare is a very dense, very dense area in Rio de Janeiro. And we started to see what are the things that shape this neighborhood? What are the problems and how can we contribute to walkability, to connection? And uh, how can we just improve by using urban space as a tool? So if you see here, the density of Rio de Janeiro uh, of this favela is half of the density of Manhattan. And if you think half of the density of Manhattan in a favela is absolutely dense, there is no greenery, as you see here from this picture, is very tight and you don't have any skyscrapers. So to create a density in buildings that are only one or two floors is super dense. And here what you see the yellow spots is that actually what something that you see in favelas is that uh, there is community. And there are spots that are like um, where kids are welcome. It could be like Capoeira Center. It could be an observatorium. It could be a football yard, a basketball yard. And we started to spot on these sites. But favelas are also very segregated inside the favelas. As, as crime grows in these areas, also the areas where children can move are very, you know, very lined up. They know that they cannot go on the other side. They can, they have to pay if they have to use their, if they want to use the football yard, it kind of belongs to someone. And all these things just created a lot of chaos. So we take the next slide, Tobias, thank you. And here, I actually, something that I say, if you go to a place and want to implement something, talk to the people, talk to the local people. As I'm sitting here with the kids from this favela asking, what do you need? What would you like? What What is the biggest problem? They say, for instance, yeah, they came, the, a government or a mayor came to do um, a skateboard yard for us, but we live under a dollar a day. No one of us owns a skateboard, but thank you for the skate yard. Uh, do you know these things continue to happen a lot as we develop cities. We don't know for whom we're building. So here we're, they're talking about greenery, they're talking about having a safe place to move. And something that in favelas exists is community because when resources are few, the currency that you have is favors. You do favors for each other and it's a currency that they use a lot. So we can move to next slide and uh, to be as here we are going back a little bit to after talking to the children we started to think like uh, what are what do we want to create we want to create the right of participation we want to create the right of uh, mobility we want to create the right to education right to play right to feel belonging you know we all have these memories of growing up in the neighborhood in the block and we want these kids to have a good memory so we can take next slide tobias Um, so this is <laughs> the Hobbes Crotch strategy. It's a idea, a metaphor for something that we created in Rio. And I don't know if you, how many of you play the Hobbes Crotch growing up. Uh, I love the Hobbes Crotch, and I actually love when you arrive to heaven after jumping around. You arrive to heaven. So we started to identify these places where kids could do things together, and we started to call them heavens, and we started to link them by the hope scratch a yellow link between uh, these uh, places in between them you can see here uh, and in the circle what you see 
is the heaven and the children. And what is outside is the people, the commoners, because people exchange favors, so they would take care of each other's children. Y while I was in Rio, they call it, uh, uh, no existe un, una cosa como otra fili de otra persona. It means uh, it doesn't exist such a thing as other people's children. They are all our children. So this is embedded in them, and they had, there is a lot of single moms in this area. So as we did a Photoshop of what, how do we, we're going to do this, how can we link these areas, and very narrow path walks because they are so tight. Uh, work, how do we know, how do we do this so that the kids know they can move here? So we told, like, we painted in yellow, and these areas, they know they're connected to the next site where they are safe. Either it's an open space, and all these places, what they have is that it's for free to come in, they can play with each other, and the commoners agree that children can move during this, I mean, in this path without fearing that they don't, they cannot move in that area. So we can take next slide. And this about the hub scratch is we needed to something that was scalable, that we can use in a literal area like a favela in some blocks or something that we can scale around Rio. Uh, next to be us. Yes, and um, we don't have the data from the experiment in Rio just because the uh, people, as I say, there, is, there are no sensors here that tell us uh, how, how many people live, how many people die. But the experiment has been done before in uh, Bogota, in my hometown, and in Curitiba, Brazil. And these pedestrian walks that have been built, walk, you know, like these place-based solutions that they have built, uh, creating links between libraries and parks and things. And in Bogota, for instance, it's a 35 kilometer long pedestrian walk that links the poorest area with the richest area. And what we saw as a result was that 42% crime drop. And it shows us that it, sustainable urban design can be the foundation for social justice. And as you mentioned, Tobias, in environmental social governance, we don't talk as much in the social part. And this just proves us that urban space and development is the beginning of social justice, something that we can implement in environmental social governance. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra, for that deep dive. Uh, I just want to want to strengthen that uh, I really like this example um, that is quite international uh, on the other side of the globe. But I think it's uh, when you when you dial it down in the end, um, it's about looking what the children really need, what are the local issues, and then have a place based solution. So um, and it's also about transforming an existing space. Yes. So. Um, I think this is where we want to uh, open the discussion and uh, also, uh, yeah, kind of yeah. welcome our little surprise guest. Yeah, welcome uh, to the to the meeting and presentation, Christian Skovacke Villadsen, Director, Associate Partner, Gale Institute. Happy to have you here, also in uh, in the room. Uh, Alejandra, I know we threw into into the discussion this way. We talked about the the car, the pooling, the parking lots, etc. Yes. Uh, before Christian, you go ahead. I just want to show because okay, this is a picture from Stockholm, from Sweden, actually. And this, the first picture here to the left, shows how many people in the population of Sweden own a car, and it's around forty five percent of the people own a car, and fifty. 55% don't are don't own a car, which means we have around 5 million cars in Sweden. We have a population of 11 million. And the second picture to the right shows how many people from the population of Sweden live in urban areas and how many people live in rural areas. And the, you see that little one, 5%. Does 87% of the population of Sweden live in 1.5% of the areas of Sweden, which means we have 5 million cars in a very tiny area. So just this is to get some perspective about density. Uh, Christian, please go ahead. 
Well, uh, thank you so much and thank you for the invitation to come in here. Um, it was very wonderful to see such uh, great projects by Kindred Spirits. Uh, when I spoke with Tobias yesterday, I, I promised also to bring up uh, some some points of difference and so on. But I, I have to say that I'm really impressed with the work I've seen. However, I, I wanted to reflect a little bit on it because I think uh, both project touches on something that for me is very important these days and that we work with as well quite extensively and that's the notion of sustainable behavior and for me sustainable behavior is simply understanding the processes needed to bring places from one uh, from one thing to another thing and to deal with the challenges that are there and i think we saw that illustrated in different ways in the in the two projects maybe very clearly illustrated also through diagrams with the last project in uh, berlin but for me, it is really understanding the processes needed to go to the place where we, at the end of the day, can change the everyday of people, can invite people to live more sustainable um, and to make it easy to do good in our cities. The other thing that the two projects uh, touch very much on, uh, from my perspective, is this notion of understanding resources. Um, we are past the moment where we can uh, demolish and bring in new stuff. We can't continue to do this in our world. We can't continue to build on green fields. We need to look at our existing cities as uh, our core development point. And again, here both projects touches very well on, on this. I think uh, we are at our office at Gale have uh, said that, you know, Greenfield isn't really a place where we should develop. We should look at brownfields. We should look at how we can densify within our existing cities, how we can bring new qualities to the city. But I think also, and maybe you had very limited time to explain the project, but I think you're doing just the same, uh, to be as an Anna, uh, to, um, to say um, by building in our existing city, we also pulled on resources that are already there. We don't have to rebuild the infrastructure. We don't have to do rebuild the public transport. And despite the fact that the, I think to be, as you mentioned, on the health perspective, that we live a little bit less long in a city, we also live less long if we commute very far. At the end of the day, living in cities is more sustainable. There's new data just came out of the Green Think Tank Considu in Denmark yeah, last year that showed that simply living in a city uh, a family of four cuts about a third of your personal CO2 footprint because of all we share. And I think your project touched very well on, on these things. The last thing you brought up was the the, 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 the notion of the amount of cars and the, uh, the, the space we use for cars in cities. And of course, this is a well-known fact. I did uh, a few years ago a project uh, with Stad, uh, for Sinatra and Stadtenwaldum in Berlin, uh, your hometown to be as, and uh, we did a very simple uh, test on um, Schönhaus Allee, one of the main arterials leading into the heart of Berlin. And here we found that I think it was 72% uh, of the cars that were long-term parking. Amount, imagine the amount of space we use in our city, and I think your last project showed that as well. We use insane amount of space for cars. Somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of our cities are streets, but that actually means that the streets makes up to somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the public spaces we have in our cities. Uh, and by public spaces, I mean, this is what we all pay to. I mean, this is the infrastructure that our tax revenue goes to and, and so on. And we should put demands on that. It shouldn't just be a monofunctional uh, car infrastructure. Streets, public spaces should really be for people. And I think that was well illustrated in the projects. Now, I, I, I want to go and uh, and uh, give other people uh, a chance to to comment, but I just wanted one last thing to be as uh, I've worked extensively in Sweden with uh, the Plattenbau, and I recognize as well uh, the German word as being very precise. However, they are almost as good in Sweden because they call Plattenbau the million program, simply referring to the amount of units they build from 64 to 74. And it's also very, very same. And I think there is something with the with the Plattenbau a million program, and that is that it was built in a modernist thinking where we had this kind of fun follow function where we divided the city up in different kind of sections. And I think what we realize today is actually function has started, has ended up being dictated by form in these areas. So to do what you have done and really rethink the, the mix of functionalities, the infrastructure, the user spaces. So these uh, pieces of city uh, can be part of uh, the city neighborhood. And that actually goes for the favelas as well. Uh, we worked with a uh, big favela in Buenos Aires, Barrio 31. And there was also about saying, this is a piece of the city. 
I've also worked with uh, Rosengorn in Malmö, one of the biggest uh, million program in Sweden of platinum projects. And one of the things we found was it's, it's like a perfect storm. It's completely monofunctional. And unfortunately, it's also deprived house area. So it's both physically segregated due to the design. It doesn't connect to the rest of the city. You have 25,000 people living there and they don't come out because a lot of them are unemployed, but actually other people don't come into the area. And you miss this opportunity of the social integra integration that happens when we share public spaces, when we share streets, when we share public facilities. And I have high hope for your project in Berlin that this is exactly what that's going to do and bring that in. So I think that was enough for me in this uh, short session and uh, I'll pass the word and be happy to join again later. Thank, thank you for that, Christian. I, I was thinking, uh, I know we are a bit over time, but I think that we can sort of steal uh, a few seconds more for, from our uh, uh, attendees' uh, work day to day. Uh, thinking about, the, to touch base a bit, Christian, on, on what you also talked about and also what both Alejandra and Tobias mentioned was this with the, with the well-being in, in transforming neighborhoods. So, so solutions regarding well-being while we do these kind of transformations. Uh, any idea on that? I, I just want to go in there to say like when we have 45% of the population that own a car, but infrastructure, like you mentioned, tax money goes for infrastructure projects. You are investing mostly in people that own a car. If you don't invest equal or 55% of the investment goes to pedestrian walks and parks and, you know, common areas, then you're not really being, you're not using these, equality does not exist. So you're giving privilege to those that own a car. I don't have anything against owning a car, but these the figures just show how we should be investing. But how then, any idea, of how could we make it more, more interesting and, and desirable not owning a car? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, Christian, that's something where you just jump, want to jump on, right? Um, I think it's, in the end, it's about attractive spaces, right? And, and uh, as we started enabling a sustainable lifestyle, we need to be able to to walk, to cross a street without barrier, especially if also for the elderly and children. And we just need to provide all the functions that are needed for daily life, right? From from the supermarket to the school to the green area, and it's um, really this. I think this idea of of well-being, of life quality, livable city. It's always a very big meta talk, right? Big, big, big words. In the end, for me, it's about really the the human perspective of a daily life. When I go from A to B, when I go and pick up my kids, when I go to work, what kind of offers do I have uh, when I when I walk, when I bike? What can I do? Can I pick up some some flowers on my way back? Is that easy? Can I just uh, get some food? And uh, I had a very long day yesterday in the office, right? So I just picked up some food, went to the park afterwards with my bike. That was easy. Um, I wouldn't have had that vacation moment if I would uh, need to first to yeah take the metro for half an hour, right? That I would never have seen the sun yesterday. So this is, I think, about um, the, the structure of the city and uh, giving the right offers and diverse offers. And these uh, areas that we talked about, the Plattenbau, and um, they lack these functions and it's actually by by the mobility we segregate these people from the city and we we de, yeah we don't give them access uh, to the same life quality so i think increasing well-being really starts with um, increasing the offers that you give to our citizens and if I were to reflect on that, I can just second what to be saying i live in the city of Copenhagen where 60% commute on bike every day and when people are asked why they bike, they don't say because it's cheap, they don't say because it's healthy, they don't say because it's good to the environment. Two thirds answer because it's easy, fast, convenient, because we brought in the infrastructure for it. Just to give a reflection on that, it's you can change uh, cultures. I mean, Copenhagen wasn't always a bike city, but you can also preserve cultures. And we work a lot in uh, in the developing world as well. And it's really interesting when we talk about the favelas, when we talk about the Bogota, but even cities like Shanghai, Beijing, that are super modernized, have a very high uh, experience of car infrastructure. Actually, 70% of the household doesn't have access to car. So it's also about preserving a culture in most of the world. We have to learn a culture in our end of the world, but it's also about preserving cultures in other ends of the world where the natural choice is 
walk, bike, or public transport today, but where they're going towards the car industry, and there we have to be leaders in, in showing the way. Actually, guys, Alejandra, Christian, Tobias, I, I think I would like to ask one final, the same question to, to all of you, starting with you, Tobias. Uh, what stands in the way of positive change? No, don't don't think too much. Just say it. <laughs> I think it's regulations. It's basically regulations. If if we if I see in projects on what we're debating on and how many um, different interests we need to combine, I mean that's that's um, the major issue that we have, especially in Berlin or in Germany. Berlin is the worst place to build because you have uh, so many different people with authority and a topic. That they need to, uh, they want to go after. One is uh, the one is protecting the green, the next one's protecting the car, the next one's protecting the local citizens. So I think it's uh, um, we we are more preserving than we are developing. So I think it's a bit of a mindset change and also the regulations where we need to be more provocative and more active. Thank you, Tobias, Christian. Well, I can only say that I think uh, it's it's back to actually the Plattenbauer, the Million Program. When we rethought our cities, we we uh, with the modernist thinking, we also rethought how we structured our city uh, entities. So we always have like a traffic department, a green department, a housing department. So what we try to do is in our processes to bring people together and actually realize the uh, in connectivity or the connectivity between the different functionalities. Uh, and of course, as uh, Tobias says, this links directly to the regulation because uh, I read at some point that 90 to 95 percent of global planning regulation was written from 1950 to 1970, where we probably built the worst cities of all times. So I think uh, the, the time has passed where we can lean on uh, on, on tradition. We need to pilot projects uh, that challenges both our processes uh, and our regulations to find new ways because we are out of time. So to speak from a sustainable point of view, we need to find solution that works with using the least resources, not just in the build process, but also enabling people to live sustainable afterwards in their everyday lives to keep reducing resources um, for the end users. Great, thank you. Alejandra, did the guys leave any words left for you? What yeah, stands no, I, I in think, our way? I think I just would have to bring the Latin American perspective and say that mostly people that get the positions of power to take, you know, like to able to take a decision own a car and don't know about the other 85% that have to commute and don't own a car. So I think the lack of knowledge uh, would be one of their in, uh, in the other side of the planet. I'd say that that's one of the things that hinder us from doing well. Thank you. Thank you all presenters and attendees in the dialogue, giving us a great platform and fundamenta with the services we can provide and with all the great insights and what we actually want to achieve in uh, uh, creating the livable cities with a possibility for prosperous health and well-being. With that, uh, a big round of applause for Tobias, Christian, Alejandra, and thank you. Thank attending. you, guys. Very thank nice. you, guys, and thank yeah. you. Thank you you attending in the, in the real-life uh, room and you in the virtual life in two weeks' time on May 28th. We'll meet the same place, the same timing, then with a focus on big data, greeting our colleague Minu Tegethoff to the room. Greetings from Dresden Summer. Happy to see you. Take care, guys. Bye -bye. See you soon out there. Bye-bye.